Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world, and welcome to episode 41 of the ESG show. Um, today, we are looking at ESG from an Asian perspective, and we have get, got guests from East to West, from the Philippines, Singapore, India, Pakistan, and the United Arab Emirates. Um, before we get moving, I just wanted to quickly tell you about a new collaboration we are doing with the ESG Disclosure Knowledge Hub. Now, um, the uh, just bear with me. Um, so, the platform the the platform is designed to empower businesses and professionals, providing valuable content and services to enhance your ESG journey. The ESG Hub offers a diverse collection of articles, videos, and toolkits covering all facets of ESG. This is episode 41 of the ESG show, and I've been busy breaking down each episode into the most interesting clips and ordering them in a logical way. That way you can access the key information provided to the ESG show in a really efficient way without, for example, having to listen to me. Um, when finished, there will be between 200 and 400 clips, plus more as we do more shows. Um, this archive of content um, forms a part of the Knowledge Hub, um, broken down into, into categories. So um, please take a look, and I have included a link to this in the comments section. Now, um, today, as I say, we're talking about issue from an Asia perspective. And I thought that we'll, before we start chatting to the guests, I thought I'd just take, I took a quick look at the economies um, in these five regions uh, and starting with GDP. Um, Philippines has a GDP of 404 million, Singapore a billion, I beg your pardon, Singapore 446 billion, India 3.4 trillion, meaning I think it's the, is it the third biggest economy in the world now? I'm not sure, Bagavi might be able to confirm whether I'm right there. Um, Pakistan, 374 billion, and the United Arab Emirates at 507 billion. Um, population, uh, obviously, as everybody watching this will know, uh, India has the biggest population of um, uh, 1.1, um, where are we? One, uh, one th I can't find billion. Oh, I've, <laughs> I've written 1.4 million here. Obviously, it's 1.4 billion. <laughs> um, uh, Pakistan, 270, 235 million. Um, Philippines, 115 million. Uh, United Arab Emirates with 9.4 million. And Singapore with 5.6 million. And then I've also looked at GDP. I won't read out the numbers to you. It's a bit boring listening to someone reading out numbers, but the graph speaks for itself. Uh, GDP per, per capita in dollars. Um, also, I think the fertility rate is very important. Funny enough, there was an article in the Financial Times today about, about the changing fertility rates around, uh, around the world. And I always think fertility is an indicator of the up and coming economy. So India is in a very strong position at the moment um, because a very significant percentage of its population are in, are in their 20s. But even in, in, in India, the fertility rate is below replacement level. So even in, in India, in a few decades time, later this century, its population will be declining. It's already happening in China. It's already happening in Japan and South Korea and then across a lot of Europe. Well, it will happen in India in a few decades time. Um, and um, but the, Philip, um, the Philippines, that the fertility rate is that much greater. And Pakistan has a much higher fertility rate. Um, and then finally, one other piece of information, economic growth. Um, looking at those charts, I think the United Arab Emirates just about had the highest growth rate. In fact, I've got the numbers written down here. 7.9% uh, in the United Arab Emirates. This was last year. India, 7.2%. Uh, oh, Philippines, 7.6%. Uh, Pakistan, 4.7%. And Singapore, 3.6%. Anyway, I think you've probably heard enough from me. And I thought it'd be a good idea if we meet the guests now. And what I'm gonna do this week is, as we talk to each guest, I'm gonna conduct 
um, I'm going to interview them. So um, I'm not going to go backwards and forwards. We do each guest talk about their perspective of ESG and whereabouts in the world they live, and, um, and then go on to the next guest. So, hello, Dan. How are you today? Good, Michael. How's it going? Yeah, very well indeed. Thank you. So uh, let me tell you a little bit about Dan. Um, whereabouts are you right now? Uh, in Quezon City, the Philippines. It's uh, part of Metro Manila. Okay. So Dan's first business was at 15 years old. Is that right? Which... You were just... 15 when you did your first business a bicycle repair activity in his in your there might have been, you know that might have been one or two before that but that was the first one that i could really call a business okay so entrepreneurial entrepreneurial ship is in your blood and you were in the u.s <laughs> navy where you were taught more basics on mechanical electrical and electronics hydraulics air compressor and air conditioning and you also taught same to some of your u.s marines you started a computer service network and security business and ran this business for 19 years with clients ranging from the highest paid Hollywood producer's wife, wow, to the fifth largest cable content provider in the US at the time. While working in the computer business, you chance upon a device that has its roots in a 1916 US patent for increasing the efficiency of those old engines and had the idea that you could do better started doing so this led to your current project the carbon cutter and so now you're working in the philippines how long have you been in the philippines sir uh, about 12 years now about 12 years okay and mm -hmm. can you tell me a little bit about the carbon cutter oh uh, sure the uh basically the car carbon cutter is a whoops, sorry i lost me no you're still there i can i, I can still I, hear you Okay, great, thank you. All right, the carbon cutter is a simple uh, engine add-on device that went through, it went through about 20 plus years of R&D. Uh, now it's Philippine government verified to reduce diesel emissions by 75%, uh, gasoline hydrocarbons by 65%, and CO2 by 17%. Um, but the carbon cutter takes only minutes to install and then it'll last the life of the engine. So we've done pilot projects ranging from two to 60 utility vehicles and got users claiming 20 to 30 percent savings, uh, which is also the CO2 reduction. And we have thousands of users uh, with zero bad effects. So uh, it's, it's doing very well. OK, thanks for that, Dan. So tell me what's big in the Philippines at the moment? Uh, weather. <laughs> the weather. Uh, yeah, it's, it's uh, rain and typhoon season here. And uh, we just had one, just went through about two days ago. And we've got another one threatening off of the off the east of us. It's over the uh, China Philippine Sea right now. Uh, but the weather hits really hard here because the Philippines is a combination of 7,000 plus islands. So when it comes through, there's there's very little to stop it, even as it goes through the country. And uh, it just hammers us. So it's hard. Okay. Okay. Well, all right. Well, I don't feel that's, I don't feel that's right. I, I'd quite like to be in the Philippines right now, I think, to be honest with you. But anyway, um, yeah. so what else is in the news in the Philippines at the moment? I think you were telling me about the issue of corruption. Well, Oh, uh, well, every every country has corruption, but I actually like uh, the corruption the visibility, I should say, here, because uh, it's, it's actually available to the public. You can actually see what's going on, whereas some other countries, it's, it's hidden from view. Uh, that tends to create a bit of a dumbed-down society. They don't actually know what's going on. So, so what do you mean by that, available to the public? I don't... Can you explain? <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, you can read about it in the papers. You can see it on, I mean, even on TV. They'll have uh, not always both sides of it, but at least they'll have the the, the article featured. Uh, 
The nice thing about the newspapers here, which are still widely read, uh, is that they're they're mostly independent. So you get all all the uh, opinions and all the different views. So it's really good. Okay, now I gather you are particularly interested in transportation um, and the electrification of transportation as well, which of course is it very important because electrification is is what we're all about on the ESG show. It's not what we're all about, but it, it is relevant to what we're all about. So tell us a little bit about um, transportation in the Philippines. Well, it's, it's actually very unique here for me as an American. Uh, when I describe the transportation here to, like, say, to the EU mobility network, uh, they're surprised because uh, developed nations have transport, you know, maybe up to the last mile. But here, the transport goes all the way to your door. And uh, it's, it's, it's very handy that way. Um, the Philippines does have electric mass transit, the rail, a rail system. Uh, but mostly, mostly diesel buses, and uh, past that, there are uh, diesel jeepneys, which are small buses, and then there are tricycle or petrol uh, tricycles. Uh, sorry, gasoline or tricycle, petrol tricycles, which those will actually take you to your home. So it is a great arrangement, but uh, without schedules, there's no schedule. The, the schedule is when the bus is full, when the trike is full, when the jeepney is full. That's when you go because the driver get, gets paid on the uh, fees. Okay, all right, thanks, sir. And and what about the electrification of transport in the Philippine, the Philippines? How is how is that going? Uh, that not going so good. Philippines is not a great area for that. Um, I, there is a famous tourist area here called Boracay, and I spoke with a gentleman that brought the e trikes into that area. And he told me that those trikes work at Boracay because the tourists don't gladly pay, like, say, USD $5 for, for a ride. Mm -hmm. But in Manila, that $5 is uh, 250 Philippine pesos. And trike rides are generally about 30 pesos. And, the you know, low-income people are not going to pay that extra for, for a trike ride just because it's neat trike. And on top of that, the Philippines has generally the highest priced electricity in Asia, and most of that is coal generated. So even if they do change to EVs right now, it's only going to shift the source of emissions from cars yeah. to the, the coal plant. Yeah. I think electric cars are slightly more energy efficient than than, than internal combustion cars, but I, I get your point. If energy is generated by coal, then yeah, quite. Okay, and how how is sort of in the Philippines? Do you have any thoughts about how climate change is regarded in the Philippines, or is it something that isn't discussed an awful lot? Is it is it is it a new story, or is it something that's not really discussed? Well, it's it's still pretty new here. I mean, I, I, I in fact, I just talked to a, a couple of fellows yesterday that uh, started a, a green consultants network. And uh, they built it up from five people in uh, 2012, I think he said, up to about 300 now. But the problem we have here is, uh, is, is survival. It's, you know, what, what am I going to eat today? You know, which is typical for, for low income, a low income area. You know, am, am I going to make it to, you know, be able to have a good sleep tonight? That's unfortunately more and well, not unfortunately, it just happens to be the case. It's more important than uh, what's going on in the, in the atmosphere. No. Okay. All right. And um, and how's carbon cutter going? Well, uh, it's building up steam again. Um, we we got we got hammered hard with COVID, just like everybody else did, uh, you know, except for the uh, vaccine suppliers, I'm sure. But um, we've got uh, we've got a lot of interest. Uh, in fact, you know, I got a distributor, just signed a distributor in Norway. Uh, 
the fellows that I saw yesterday were also possible distributors here in the Philippines. Okay. And, uh, you know, we've got good tests. We've got, uh, we've had, uh, it's, it's looking, starting to look like people actually paying attention. I hope they do because of the fact that we can, we can outdo, let's say if you purchase an electric vehicle, we can outdo those emissions for the same price by a factor of about 500. So, uh, you know, we're, it's it's a good way for countries to meet their NDC goals, uh, SDG goals, et cetera, et cetera, clean air goals. It, it's a good way to do it for them to do it without going broke. Okay, well, thanks for that, um, Dan. Please yeah. do add anything to the comments about Carbon Cutter and, and links and so on, and that'd be great. Um, can you join us again in a few minutes? Yeah, sure. Thank you very much. Uh, so also on the show today is Asif. Are you there, Asif? Oh, hi there. Um, how how are you today, and 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 where are you right now? Hi, Mike, and hi everyone else in the show. Good evening from Perth, Western Australia. Ah, yes, you're in Australia, aren't you, at the moment? Oh, and I'm just be, wearing uh... a jacket because it's a bit cold. It must be the middle of the night where you are, I would have thought, isn't it? Well, not really. So it's uh, around eight, eight plus. Okay. Okay. Now, you're based in Singapore, of course, aren't you, I think, I believe? Yes. Yes. So, so Asif is the ESG Visiting Scholar at Nanyang, if I pronounce that correctly, Nanyang Technological University and a Director of Circular Economics PTE Limited. Um, but Asif, I gather you've traveled around rather a lot. Um, where have you worked? Well, in terms of work, most of my working life, I was in Australia and Singapore. Not too many okay. places. And I spent a couple of years in Bangladesh as well. I do still do a lot of work with Bangladesh. But I've traveled to every continent because when I was a kid, I, I always wanted to see the world, experience life lived, lived by everybody else. So I went to different places and I tried to go to one new country every year that I've not been before. So, okay. yeah, that's so you've been to quite a few places then. You've probably been to a lot more places than I have, I should think. Um, uh, I couldn't tell that unless you tell me how many countries you visited, then I well, can tell. Well, I'll have this conversation, but maybe I don't want everyone, I don't think everyone watching the ESG show is particularly interested yeah, that's fine. in what countries <laughs> I've been to. Um, but I'm fairly confident it's more than, more than me. Um, now, um, any particular insights you've had from your travels, especially in Asia, and from the point of view of ESG? So what, what have you learned, not from us, about ESG, and how it's regarded across Asia, given that you're such a traveled man? Well, I think travel has given me a lot. I think I learned most in my life from traveling, from life of different people in Africa, South America, Central America, Australia, all over pretty much in Asia I've been to. And I learned from every different community. I learned from their language, their food, their culture, and how their culture and climate is connected, how their economic activities are connected with the climate. So that's something I've observed when I was much younger. And in terms of ESG, I would say that ESG as a term officially was born as when it was introduced by this document called Who Cares Wins by UNEP Financial Initiative around 2005-06. Before that, if we synonymously used ESG um, and investing and responsible investment side by side. So actually, if we replace the G with R and call it environmental and social responsibility, that probably we had for hundreds of years, thousands of years, everywhere. We just didn't call it ESG. And the truth no. is, what I've learned from traveling that without this ESR, 
this responsibility, we could not survive as a society, as a, as a community, as human beings. So that's why ESG is very important. We call it in official terms now, but it, ha it has been around for thousands of years. Yeah, interesting. I suppose it's what's in a name, you know, that which we it's call a rose by any other name would smell so sweet. <laughs> and, um, and in fact, we had the person, one of the people who actually helped coin the acronym ESG on the ESG show a few, a few weeks ago. And I think if I remember correctly, it was 2004. It might have been 2005. So, yeah, um, yeah. In, in four, five, yeah. six, the, the document was called Who Cares Wins. Uh, it was published by Union Financial Initiative. Right. OK. Yeah. So, yeah. OK. So you're also closely involved with Circular Economics, which has won the 2024 Sustainability Award. Congratulations. Can you tell Thank me you. a little bit more about circular economics and um, well, tell me more about circular economics and your award? Um, starting with circular economics, circular economics is a term actually I've learned as a student in the first chapter of environmental economics. And circular economy principle basically teaches us that everything has to be circulated. If we extract, use and dispose in a world, we cannot survive. We just continue to create wastes. So definitely we have to use the circularity principle and life cycle assessment. And that's a very important part of sustainability technically. And I started circular economics back in 2019. And before that, I was mostly working with academia, academia in policy institutes. And one of my observation over the last 30 years of involvement with sustainability policy that academia, government, and industry are the three key players in sustainability. Government provides the policy and legitimacy to various supports that sustainability program requires. Academia can provide the research and innovation supports. And industry should have the right motivation and the business case for running the programs. So it often happens that they work in silos and there's not a space which can be created to bring them together. So based on my experiences and my own network that I developed working in this, all these players over the last 25, 30 years, I decided to set up this company to create a platform where I can actually bring governments, industries and universities together to solve critical climate and complex climate problems, as well as collaborate to solve bigger problems. So in this process, I would say that we have, I'm, although I'm just mostly working in the corporate strategy and public policy arena in a bro broader picture, we have also been doing plenty of pilot projecting to make sure that our policies are really well grounded and therefore they're more practical. So we had a lots of pilot projects we have been running. And two of my main partner and collaborator and supporter has been uh, actually in Australia, Curtin University. And in Bangladesh, the governance innovation unit in prime minister's office. With these two uh, government and universities, I have actually created more than 30 pilot projects on SDG localizations, uh, and various aspects of sustainability over the last five, six years, and provided lots of um, credible policy solutions. So it was recognized by the Singapore as a, one of the most innovative uh, advisory service provider this year, and that's why we have been awarded the 2024 Sustainability Award. And we are also trying to help companies in the similar way. And right now, I'm working on a project which is uh, most more about finding out the financial cost of climate change and climate risk for the companies, not for the government. And it's not actually reinventing the wheel. For the public policy decision, public investment decision, cost-benefit analysis and CBA tools have been used for the last 50, 60 years around the world. So we actually have a quite a significant amount of technical tools used for public policies, but similar 
tools can actually be used for private investment decisions, which asset management companies, private investors, they require. So I'm just trying to do now another project that I'm working with NTU is uh, looking at the financial cost of uh, environmental and social uh, aspects of doing business so that it can create a value bank that businesses can benchmark against and refer to and eventually uh, the policymakers and the regulators can look at these numbers. So it's more about um, circular economics is main business is doing policy research, contract research and providing advisory services. So, and we, we work with like professionals basically, yeah, and industries. Okay. okay, and how is ESG regarded in Singapore? Well, ESG is definitely a um, getting a lot of attention both in public policy and in the corporate governance in recent years. Um, in Asia, compared to many other countries, of course, like Japan, they are doing very well in Korea, they are doing very well, China doing very well in ESG. In Southeast Asia and South Asia, I would say Singapore is doing very well in terms of ESG, that they have brought it up in a very, uh, with, a, with a lot of importance. Government in Singapore is, um, uh, very interested in seeing the Singapore leading in this area, in this region. And uh, they made ESG reporting compulsory quite a few years ago, I think 2016. And now they have continuously developing and improvising the formats. And this is well communicated with people. And it now from the next year, everybody has to do climate reporting and all the listed companies and subsequently, non-listed, big non-listed companies will also have to do climate reporting. So ESG climate reporting, um, these are getting pretty big in Singapore. It's going everywhere. And if listed companies are doing, if big companies are doing, then every small and medium companies within or under their value chain sooner or later will have to do it or comply with. Uh, the requirement, especially when scope through emu emission has to be reported by the bigger companies. So Singapore is definitely doing very well and leading the way uh, in a, quite significantly in recent years. Okay, that's very interesting. And how, I mean, from your perspective as a as a travel man, how do you feel that compares with, with other Asian countries? Well, um, as I said that in Asian countries, in terms of community, I would say all the indigenous communities, all, all their countries, they had their own ways of uh, looking at it. And the most importantly, in, you would note that in Asia, when it comes to business, money is still the big problem. So everybody is really more focused on finances rather than environment and society. So one of the biggest challenges that ESG while it's mandated also in Indonesia, also in Malaysia and other ASEAN countries, everybody is looking at ESG. But as uh, Dan mentioned, even also in Philippines, people are more, uh, more conscious about the money, the businesses. So one of the critical points, what I see missing in Asia is that I think it also applies to other countries too, that the businesses has to find clear linkage between climate change and doing business. There's definitely, there is a clear linkage. Of course, climate change will affect our businesses and our value chain. But businesses often do not see it, do not see the immediate effect. So there is a research gap, there is a knowledge gap, there is a capacity gap. And this gap can vary widely um, among the Asian countries as they have, they're in different stages of development. For example, if you go within the ASEAN, if you go from Singapore to Myanmar, they're in a very different stages of development. And therefore understanding of uh, these concerns are quite different. Um, so I was, I was, yeah, I was gonna say the cost, of capital, the cost of capital is an issue as well. So whereas there might be a strong business case for ESG in the long term, if the cost of capital is quite high and, and companies, it, and it's much harder to raise the funding, then worrying about the long term might be a luxury. Well, it's the cost of going green is definitely not, not zero. And whether 
you can how much you need to invest to go green or to be environment friendly or design your process according to uh, can be nature based or ecosystem based can can be very costly but it not necessarily costly it can be cheap as well oh. i can give example cheap examples where you can actually go uh, go environment friendly without with a very low cost okay thanks for that asif i think we we need to move on but please sir go please yeah. don't go away please come back uh, and please if you want to provide more information use the comments section but but come back again in a few minutes i need to talk to turn to bagavi now hello bagavi how are you today hello i'm good how where, are you? where are you talking from right now bangalore india right okay and what's the weather like where you it's, it's hot in india at the moment isn't it i was really no, it's very evening. cold it's a it's a nice evening here oh is it oh it's Good the day. evening yeah. but didn't i hear that in some parts of india the temperatures have reached 50 degrees in the last yeah, few it, days it had reached now it is like pretty much coming down it's, it's a beautiful weather today okay so anyhow subgavi hamanth have i pronounced that correctly yeah hamanth okay from from uh, Bangalore, India, is an experienced agile business analyst with over 20 years in ESG, sustainability, banking, and financial services. She holds an executive education certificate from IMM Bangalore. If I pronounce, is that Bangal Bangalore? Is that correct? Bangalore. 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 In ESG management and reporting, an ESG enthusiast, Bagavi continuously expands her knowledge and applies her expertise in ESG reporting frameworks. She excels in agile frameworks, business analysts, process improvements, and stakeholder engagement. Through her Sleetu Balapa Foundation, Bagavi leads environmental education initiatives for children, supports forest watchers, and collaborates with the government to protect forests and wildfire. Her work underscores her commitment to sustainability, community well-being, and the promotion of ethical government and social responsibility. So, Gavi, I'm interested in this um, forest work that you're doing. We've actually got a, um, one of the themes from the ESG show later this in the summer is the business case for the rainforest. So can you tell me a little bit about the uh, forest watchers work that you do? Yeah, sure. Uh, and thanks for uh, having me on the show, Mike. Uh, so so this forest watchers, right, and the elephant task force, uh, they are the unsung heroes of the forest. So they guard the forest, they protect the natural habitat, they resolve human-animal conflicts. They also ensure that the animals don't enter the human habitats. So they do a lot of service tirelessly and also they are away from their families. Uh, and uh, they are pretty much coming from the tribal communities uh, who are very well versed in, in studying the environment because generations together they are living in the forest. and. Uh, it is important to recognize their efforts and uh, and also help their families support them. So from Slay to Balapa Foundation, what we do is we try to give them jackets uh, during the winter, torches or any wild equipments which they require so that they perform their duties better. Motivating them is very essential because since there are very much many jobs outside the forest, so they're very much eager to come out of the forest and come to the you know city. But but if they come to the city, then we nobody is there to guard the forest. So we need to make them stay there, keep them motivated and uh, keep them content. So we donate whatever they require. And also we uh, we take uh, if whatever they require, like you know, their government schemes, anything which they are, which is applicable to them, we make a request and publish it to the government so that government can provide those facilities. Okay, thanks for that. And can you tell me about the work you do with that? And I'm going to struggle to pronounce it again. Uh, the Sleetu Balapa Foundation. Yes. Please correct me if that's wrong. Related to environmental issues. Yeah. So. Uh, from uh, in Slade Balapa Foundation, what we do is we make sure that the children, right, the children, especially the government school children, are uh, connected to the environment. They're aware about uh, the environment, aware about protecting the environment. So what we do is we uh, we conduct sap, uh, uh, planting uh, tree saplings, especially fast growing shaded tree saplings. 
and they will you know plant it in their school around around their schools and we also uh, want to revive this old gurukul system wherein our the guru that is the teacher used to sit under the tree and impart the knowledge and value based sessions and we want to bring the same culture back so what we do is by planting those trees and taking care of the environment they are able to connect you know uh, get more closer to the nature and you know and they will also observe that how on, on the trees when they grow and they water the uh, plants saplings the tree will grow and they will see all the birds and animals having making the tree their homes so th and also encourages outdoor learning uh, just want to continue this it's a uh, it feels really good to uh, make sure the children are working uh, towards this okay sounds amazing so Zipagavi, tell me about the state of ESG in India right now. And can you tell me about the Securities and Exchange Board of India, the SEBI? Yeah. SE, yeah, sure. So the state of ESG in India is like developing rapidly. Uh, thanks to efforts of our regulator, SEBI, right? Uh, Securities and Exchange Board of India, continuously coming up with comprehensive frameworks to meet Indian context and Indian business needs. And also they are constantly striving to protect the Indian investors. So uh, SEBI is a regulatory body of India and they regulate the stock, stock exchanges, the market participants, the listed companies, companies and they make sure that every their uh, concerns are met and they're constantly uh, evolving to you know uh, report ESG and uh, SEBI is uh, you know uh, you know determined to pioneer India as the top uh, in the emerging markets uh, I in terms of ESG reporting so they have they have constantly evolved so you can say uh, since 2012 they have come up with ESG uh, reporting standards they had a first standard called BRR business regulatory reporting and then the next day where they said that top 100 listed companies must report ESG that was in 2012 and 2019 they came up with uh, uh, a brsr framework they, they they evolved those old frameworks and they said that the, the top uh, 500 companies must report esg and uh, in 2021 onwards they came up with this uh, 2021 20, uh, onwards they came up with this brsr framework which is a comprehensive favor considering all the esg factors and they said that top thousand listed companies must report ESG and Indian companies have been so proactive that they have you know it has crossed that uh, benchmark you know it's more than thousand hundred or you can say close to thousand two hundred or thousand three hundred companies have reported uh, ESG or uh, as per the RSR framework it is a uh, and that is one thing and uh, they are you know they're coming up with frameworks for the upcoming uh, uh, years also they also have something called brsr core so it is core means they have they are focusing on the nine kpis related to environmental and social impact and they're making sure that this uh, through this core initiative they are tracking how the companies are giving jobs to smaller towns creating a social impact taking care of the gender diversity and the you know well-being of the small towns also so this is about sebi uh, i would like to say and uh, you, you uh, we also have something called somebody called rbi rbi is our central bank of india so rbi has come up with the uh, you know uh, law uh, uh, draft a guideline saying that all the banks and financial services uh, should uh, ensure that the climate change, the cli impact of climate change on the banks and financial uh, institutions are also monitored and uh, reported. So that is something which RBI has taken care of and is exclusively for banking and financial services. And uh, yeah, India India has been very proactive and SEBI, SEBI has been extremely uh, proactive in this approach. Okay, thanks for that. So that's the RBI, the the, uh, the yes. central bank. That's Reserve, the central bank. Of Reserve India. Bank of India. Reserve Bank of India. Reserve Bank of India. Okay. Yeah. I remember a few years ago, the India Central Bank had a very famous governor, didn't it? I can never remember his name, but there was a very he was uh, one of the world's leading economists. Um, I can't remember his name now. If you remember, please let me know. But uh, sure, anyhow, sure. Um, tell me about the issue rating provide ratings providers in India. Um, um, 
and how do the new SCBI regulations benefit users? Yeah, sure. This is a very interesting question because uh, SEBI recently, you, I, as I said earlier, SEBI is constantly evolving, right? And SEBI has come up with a master circular for all the ESG rating providers in India. So what they have done is any ESG rating provider in India must be registered under SEBI. So that is a they have to be certified by SEBI to provide ESG ratings. So that is a first, uh, uh, you know, the, the guidelines of that circular ESG master circular for rating providers. It's called ERP master circular for from SEBI. And they also have a business model. So either you can be it is a single business model. And then uh, thank you, Faisal. Thanks for reminding. Uh, it is a single um, business model, right? You can't, they, there is no hybrid. You can't, they can't, they either this model or that model. So the two models are subscriber paid model or a issuer paid model. Subscriber is if somebody wants to view the ESG ratings of a company, they subscribe and they pay a fees. And issuer paid model is something where uh, if they, if it is a company, if they want to know their ESG ratings, they have to uh, register and they pay the fees and know the ESG ratings. And so that there's no conflict of interest. And also there are like six different types of rating ESG, uh, SEBI mandates, like, you know, should take care of. One is the environment rating, social rating, governance rating, a combined rating, and also sector specific rating, like, you know, you can say technology, industries, etc. And there's something called thematic rating, where it says that if it is a climate related or anything related to human rights, exclusive ratings. And they also have a lot of disclosure, like saying that, you know, it should be public disclosure. Everybody must be able to uh, see the ratings. There should be complete transparency and accountability. And they also conduct audits with those ESG rating providers so that they are adhering to SEBI guidelines. Now coming to your other question, like what are the various ESG rating providers? So we have like Crystal, uh, there is an ICRA, the Crystal Analytics, then MSCI, CARE, and KPMG. So there are these are the top six uh, rating providers who are certified by SEBI. Uh, yeah, and you had asked me about the benefits. Yes, there is a, you know, rating methodologies are defined by SEBI. They have to follow to that. And second thing is there is no conflict of interest. Uh, whatever it, uh, they are uh, seeing from the rating provider is what SEBI is also seeing, the investor is also seeing. The company is also seen, and also the rationale for behind every rating, right? That is defined. So they can't just go ahead with the, like you know, uh, they can't make their customization. So that is a very good thing uh, about uh, SEBI. And uh, definitely, I would like to say that uh, India is the only country. You, uh, I, 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 as per my knowledge, you, you also is going to that. India is the only country where the ESG rating providers are regulated. There is a national okay. law. Okay, now that's very interesting. Oh, and thank you for your comment, uh, Faisal, about the name of uh, um, Ragoram. Um, I don't know if I said that correctly. Please correct me if I'm wrong. I can tell you that he, but I can tell you that I read, read one of his books, a book called Fault Lines, which is a fabulous book written just after the 2008 crisis. That was very interesting, Bagavi. So to the first best of your knowledge, India is the only country that regulates the ESG rating providers, so I think that's yeah. quite an interesting point. Yeah, so there is a national law, uh, I would like to explain that here, uh, that every other country is uh, having a uh, regulatory uh, guidelines, which is overall, like, you know, the credit, everything is a, it's a consolidated uh, rating, uh, you know, the uh, guidelines. But when it comes to India, specific, SEBI has exclusively come, coming, has come up with something for rating, ESG ratings. So, it is uh, uh, focused on ESG and the frameworks are for ESG, unlike any other country. So I'm proud about that. Okay, well, thank you for that, Bhagavi. I think we need to thank move you. on, but please don't go away. Yeah. Um, I'd like sure. to get you back on thank again you. shortly. I need to introduce Hera now. Uh, hello, Hera. Um, how are you and where are you in the world today? I am all good. I hope you're doing well as well. I'm based in Lahore, Pakistan. Okay, so here is so it. Is it? What's the temperature where you are today? Uh, it went up to forty-six Celsius today. Ooh, that is hot, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. Mind you, I actually would like it to be hot. I've I've got 
I've got my, I don't have great knees. My knees, and the hotter it is, the better my knees are. So I, I reckon if it was 46 degrees, I'd, I'd feel like I was a, a young man again. But anyway, um, so here at uh, Ruani is a distinguished sustainability leader, uh, leader renowned for her adaptedness in integrating sustainability into corporate strategies. With a focus on luxury fashion construction and oil and gas industry, she has consistently delivered impactful solutions. Hero's commitment to sustainability practices is evident in her work where she prioritizes ethical sourcing and transparent supply chains. Her expertise in environmental reporting and ESG systems has driven compliance and innovation, positioning her as a pioneer in the industry's sustainable transition. Additionally, Hira is skilled in forging and partnering and leading stakeholder engagements to achieve sustainability goals effectively. So Hira, tell me a little bit about ESG in Pakistan at the moment is quite a uh, kind of uh, this is the time when we are all focusing on the ESG in this uh, specifically in the export sector I'll be focusing on the two sides the government perspective and the private sector uh, the ESG is right now which is environmental social and governance is gaining significant traction at the moment in Pakistan from the government side uh, we have seen increased efforts in in all in, uh, in to incorporate ESG into business policies into their national policies and they want the businesses to adopt these things to be more resilient to be more uh, like adaptive uh, to, to be very resilient against the climate change okay there are a few things like uh, for example i'll give some examples of the uh, regulations in place and the initiatives here like we have environmental uh, pakistan environmental protection department and they are working on this we have that law pakistan environmental protection act that was first came and existed in 1997 so according to this uh, it all focuses on environmental stewardship all the companies all the businesses because my experience is more uh, towards the uh, development of sustainable strategies for businesses incorporating all of these esg pillars into their business model and help them understand how they can be more competitive and how can they can market all of those things when they are doing to be more green and more uh, focused on the future so in the private sector i can tell there are more things which are like uh, focused on esg principle uh, for example, our export industry that is very much focusing on everything, all the initiatives they have to sign up for. Uh, they are even focusing on the voluntary uh, uh, initiatives like SPTI, all the things which are being implemented and requested by the, uh, the like branch. I, I have my experience with textile, so I know a lot of the good brands which are exporting their products from Pakistan, and all of those suppliers have to comply a lot of things. I know from 2017, I have seen companies reporting on carbon footprinting, and they are adopting. Uh, the new standards were like as you know csrd is here so companies are now trying to understand what is this but yes there is one challenge we need to identify the gap basically there is awareness gap there is capacity gap and we need to focus on that part so it is on right uh direction i can say that sun is moving in right direction but we need more uh a push for it we need to bridge that gap with some relevant skills and knowledge hubs to uh, help people be skillful and help uh, integrate these principles into their businesses okay thank you for that and can you talk tell me very very briefly about esg and sustainable investments and then um can you tell me about your thoughts about this especially in the context of pakistan uh, yeah, definitely. If I talk from the government perspective, there are now a few loans and green bonds which are available for uh, different sustainable initiatives. Like we have seen a very digital uh, transition for Pakistan as well. They are from uh, after COVID, we are focusing more on the digital solutions. We are focusing more on be green and be resilient to uh, see it, bear everything, and um, be very helpful for the community. Uh, so there are a lot of things for financing for green businesses, for green solutions. The government is giving different opportunities, and even they are offering the tax rebates. And if I talk about the private sector, that is definitely always a step ahead of the government. The thing because they want that uh, the, that funding for uh, being competitive. If, and if you are working on ESG, you are uh, competitive. You have some edge over your competitors. And they, that depends on how much you are dedicated and how much you have integrated those principles into your core. So yes, 
and i personally believe this is going to be one major uh, one major uh, area where pakistan will see um, progress in coming years in the next decade because they are now we have seen a surge of new startups coming green startups coming for funding and there there have been different rounds in singapore and different countries of the different areas of world where the pakistani startups are gaining some good funding because of their green uh, solution offering okay so thanks for that um and what about COVID? How's that affected um, Pakistan? And has that had any impact upon ESG awareness? Uh, definitely it had a very great impact on that because it was something like an eye opener for all of the people who suffered for all of the industry who got, which got shut down because they knew, they realized, okay, there is something they're not doing right. Basically, it was, I totally believe it was COVID that made all of the, these industry leaders, founders, and the business owners uh, think about how they can be more resilient and when the community is impacted our business is impacted if some businesses are impacted the community is impacted it is always linked to each other so when you are after covid when companies started to get back to their usual business that we call real business today uh, still there is a huge change because now we want to be more resilient we want to uh, be in that position that if something like this comes later we need to understand and I have seen a huge, huge change in the behaviors of uh, like customers and the behaviors of the companies because they want to serve the community as well. They have a lot of companies in here now have their in, in the internal indicators. They want to track their progress against. They have allocated budget to help communities to resolve some water related or ecological uh, related issues. So that's how they are trying their best to uh, keep it uh, the impacts of such events minimum. And they want to be resilient in those time. And that's why they are helping the community uh, to educate. I have seen in a program where people are offering uh, students to come and uh, do some project, innovating project or against some uh, climate related uh, uh, thought or maybe some idea or some issue and they fund for that. So uh, this is something very uh, like a uh, new and this is something I really appreciate if companies keep doing this as uh, soon we will be in the position to have a solution for such incidents. Okay, thank you for that. And then just one more question before we move on. Um, but can you tell me a little bit um, can your answer as quickly as possible as well? Uh, can you tell me a little bit about regulation, ESG-related regulation in Pakistan? So, uh, from that perspective, now the government is like the first was in 2019 by Pakistan Stock Exchange, and all of the listed companies were supposed to uh, uh, report on that framework of ESG and disclose all the information. And then after that, we have seen a significant uh, progress in that. Uh, the Ministry of Climate Change, and there are a lot of different things which are always issue the climate risk and adaptation documents, and there are a lot of regulations they have to fulfill. The Environmental Protection Department has a certain criteria all the industries have to fulfill, and then uh, they have their uh, and their system for accountability and transferability uh, uh, of different data information systems. So this is there, but the major focus of the current market is on uh, the, 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 the industry which is on the right track is uh, the export sector because they are complying with all the relevant regulations and all the almost European regulations which are in place. And that's make them stand out and that, that's why they are there for the competition. So uh, the export sector is doing very well, and I hope the other the local industry is also on the right track because now they are uh, being uh, like they are in that position. They know okay, something is different when the export sector is getting all the business. They are in the domain because you know this economy is. Uh, if I talk about six months back, the economy of Pakistan was about to just shatter. So there are a lot of changes. A lot of uh, companies are trying to be very resilient in these times, and they understood okay if they want to stay in the business, there is one thing that is ESG they need to incorporate and maybe then they can get in that export service thing. So yes, uh, there are a lot of regulations, but for the regulations export industry as are adopting, these are the key for the progress and for the right direction. Okay, well, thank you for that, Hira. Please join us again in a few minutes. Um, we are running way over, but uh, we'll probably extend it a little bit longer. But thanks for that. So please join us in a few minutes. I'd like to have a brief chat with uh, Brijesh. So um, thank you. Uh, hello. Uh, Bridgesh, how are you today? Um, I to say, how are you today? It's a particularly relevant question to you because I believe you had a bit of an accident recently. So, uh, how are you? And what was your accident? And are you feeling better? I'm feeling better. Thank you for asking, and thank you for bringing such nice perspectives on ESG from Asian context. Uh, I'm feeling better now. Uh, at least I can't drive at least for three days. Otherwise, I'm fine. Started uh, taking some 
meetings today afternoon and uh, now i'm here so thank you so much for asking and uh, i'm looking forward to the discussion okay well lovely to have you here Bridget. is a globally recognized sustainability professional with more than 20 years of expertise in sustainability esg environmental man management energy management and climate change he worked on multi-million dollar initiatives across a variety of businesses resulting in considerable financial environmental savings notably british has played a key role in securing sustainable finance from the ifc obtaining carbon credits and building management systems to save over a hundred million US dollars via several strategic initiatives within these topics. He has an executive MBA in environmental management, a bachelor's degree in chemical engineering, and a member of notable qualifications include a chartered environmentalist, CFA certification in ESG, GRA, GRI, certified sustainability professional certificate, PMP, and ISWA certified waste management professional. British, British's inclusive approach and dedication to sustain, sustainability establish him as a renowned thought leader in the sector. British, as I understand it, you are, um, you, you, I think you're India, I think you are Indian by origin, but you now live in the United Arab Emirates. Is that right? Absolutely. Okay. And um, so let me just um, get you on the screen more fully. So, um, um 2020 22 in 2022 <laughs> that's quite a difficult date to say quickly that is uh, in 2022 the securities and commodities authority mandated esg reporting for listed companies in the united arab emirates uh that seems like a big deal how is that panning out and what is the upside uptake like and what are the failures to comply Thank you so much for the question. Uh, in fact, Leah, yes, this SCA mandated ESG reporting for listed businesses in 2022, and those listed, listed businesses were more than 130 entities. Uh, I see this as a major step towards countries' commitment to sustainable business practices. So basically, this strategy has seen around more than 80% of compliance until now, and it actually indicates very high acceptance rate. Uh, the rule basically mandates full disclosure of environmental, social and governance practices, which uh, improves business transparency and governance. Uh, yes, uh, when we see penalty from financial terms, yes, it is up to 80, 50,000. But um, as a sustainability and climate change professional, for me, in addition to this financial or monetary penalties, uh, I would also see that non-compliant companies may face reputational damages as well. And they can also see like uh, potential investor may stay out of those companies. So it in turn emphasizes the critical nature of this uh, uh, adhering to this particular mandate. Uh, uh, moreover, this particular rule has uh, accelerated our progress towards the uh, U.S. bigger picture, uh, which are uh, compliance to sustainability targets, such as we the UA 2031, then um, uh, UN climate uh, 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 climate change and SDG and Paris Agreement, as well as the National Climate Change Plan 2017-2050. And uh, in turn, it encourages a shift to a green economy and long-term sustainable development. So the benefits uh, basically affects uh, extend beyond the UAE, encourages increased regional cooperation and investment basically uh, across the GCC as well as Asian markets. And this alignment has increased our economic resilience, encouraged uh, international investment and established the UAE as a sustainable financial powerhouse basically resulting in considerable economic and environmental advantages uh, for the region. Okay, very interesting. Um, so the UAE hosted the 28th session of the United Nations Conference of the Parties, COP, uh, in November uh, last year. Uh, it's COP28, I think. Um, so what kind of impact has that had, do you think? It had a significant strategic influence on the GCC and Asian markets. So first is basically uh, it emphasizes uh, UAE's leadership in global climate action and it reiterates our pledge to achieve net zero emissions by 2050. 
And this event facilitated regional cooperation, resulting in investment in energy transition projects, mainly into renewable and uh, sustainable technologies uh, such as carbon capture, utilization and storage across the GCC, uh, which are very much crucial for economic diversification away from uh, traditional fossil based uh, uh, businesses. But uh, furthermore, uh, COP28 strengthened links between the UAE and Asian market um, by highlighting green economy and sustainable infrastructure development. And uh, this alignment basically, it's not only attracted global investment, but also established uh, UAE as a regional, again, powerhouse for sustainable finance. So it has ripple effect. And it was very clear because after COP28 or even during COP28, our neighboring GCC countries uh, improved their sustainability agendas and Asian markets expanded their green investments. So it actually in turn boosted economic resilience and fostered us uh, towards more sustainable development trajectory. So in a nutshell, COP28 in the UAE was a watershed moment and watershed event that um, increased regional and international collaboration on climate measures, resulting in considerable economic and environmental advantages for the GCC and Asian market. Okay, thank you for that. So. Um... So the Abu Dhabi global market has identified sustainable finance as a strategic priority and was the first international financial center globally to become carbon neutral. Um, that sounds interesting. Is that a trend, do you think? Yeah, it's a part of wider trend because this decision reflects uh, the rising understanding of financial centers vital role in driving global sustainability initiatives. So locally, this dedication serves basically as a role model for the other financial institute in the UAE and the broader GCC to incorporate sustainability into their uh, operations and business practices. And it encourages, again, green investment and support, supports economic diversification. Regionally, this program is very much consistent with the GCC's overall sustainability aims uh, that promotes uh, cross-border cooperation on green finance and sustainable infrastructure projects. On a larger scale, this particular movement is gaining attraction across Asia. So Asian financial centers are very much progressively incorporating ESG concepts into their financial systems. So it creates a favorable climate for long-term perspectives and long-term investment perspective in general. So this transformation, not only according to me, it strengthens regional economic resilience, but also establishes Asia as a worldwide sustainability leader. So by focusing on sustainable finance, ADGM not only sets as a local example, but also contributes to a worldwide movement that uses financial market to combat climate change and promote a sustainable development. So according to me, this movement creates several chances or opportunities for innovation, investment and cooperation within the local, regional and Asian financial landscapes. I think... Uh, Michael, you're there? Hello, Michael. I think we lost our host. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Yeah. Uh, it's no, 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 no. Um, so I was chatting away and nobody could hear a word I was saying. So what I was actually saying is thank you for that, Rajesh. I'm now get, I've got some more questions for you and indeed some more questions for Hera. But I'd like to bring everybody in um, to look at some of these issues now. Um, um, now... There's, Asia's a, a massively diverse um, continent, obviously. I don't, I, you know, it's one of the most obvious things I suppose I could say. Um, what, is, what is any integration, of, what if any integration are we seeing in Asia? Uh, or if not in Asia, maybe in a region within Asia, such as the ASEAN countries. Hera, I thought perhaps you could sort of initially have a go answering that question and I'll open it to all of you. And we are way over time, by the way, so I would ask you all to talk quite quickly. But uh, ESG integration, um, what are we seeing in Asia, do you think, Hera? Yeah, so uh, there is that uh, 
built of companies and i have seen people learning about it you can see all the young people who are working with these domain or all the companies they want to offer their solutions they are very much interested and they have that will to offer something that is very relevant to esg so i really like it when i see people working in the similar domain they want to offer something that is helpful that is ahead of their time and that is actually relevant and in, in accordance with all the uh initiatives and regulation frameworks have available like if i talk about the global reporting initiative uh it is the most adopted uh initiative of ever like uh in its sustainability that it, the, there is one a global reporting initiative gri reporting framework that all the companies are like adopting where they want to start where somewhere they have to adopt this and they can fulfill and they can report all of, like majority of esg indicators mentioned in there and they are like 80 percent of all the frameworks are always in line so in asia, in asia there is that trend which is very good for the progress which is very uh, uh like empowering that we can do and people are willing to do that but then again they are looking for the opportunities they are looking for uh uh, that skill to learn like if i talk about the uh, blue cultures you go being and asians there are a lot of uh, tech companies which are working and which are offering solutions but in this context if i there are there are a few few or less companies working in this uh, tech side of uh, things to integrate and automate all of these things but we can almost 50% 50% reduce the hassle if we develop something that is automated integrated and it is uh, created in some way that it helps companies basically the manufacturer the big corporations to develop all of these things and offer solutions to spe this specific region and for that we need skill we need resources and we need capacities okay thank you for that so and um, what about anybody else is anyone else uh, want to come in on the topic of esg integration in asia or within a sub region within asia I think um, I would like to contribute a bit here because it's um, like EU has a very common taxonomy. They have an EU taxonomy on various areas. Um, in Asia, across all countries, actually not only Asia, in other regions as well, for sustainability reporting, people use companies predominantly have been using the GRI framework, but I don't see it as an integration. The reason Everybody is using GRI framework because GRI framework is a good starting point for companies who are new to reporting because it's simple, it's easy to start with, etc. But what really is important for integration is some sort of setting similar standards which the companies within the region can use. So ASEAN has developed recently ASEAN taxonomy for sustainable finance. And that's one of the significant sub-regional integrational steps in, in ESG and sustainable finance because they have lots of companies within working within Malaysia, Indonesia, Thailand, Philippines, Singapore. They have their value chain attached to each other and they require certain taxonomy to make sure they standardize their sustainability practices. So that's probably the only and the most important uh, sub-regional um, integration I can see. But separately, Japan is doing very well in terms of ESG performance. Korea is doing very well. China's journey toward green economy has been quite good and quite progressive uh, over the last 20 years as well. But in terms of that, there are individual countries and individual pockets they are doing. Um, I was in the Middle East because we have, uh, I was in COP as well last year. Middle East. Uh, definitely is a very complex area in terms of integration. Dubai, um, Abu Dhabi, and UAE in general is trying to lead these areas in the, in the COP. Saudi Arabia came up with a lot of new ideas for green technology development. They had a big stall and they want to uh, make some progress. Again, in terms of integration, I didn't see much initiative among the Middle Eastern countries to create the similar block that ASEAN has. So um, that's probably uh, one of the significant starting points from Asia for integration. But of okay, course, the diversity is a challenge. Yeah, thanks, that, Asif. That was a really nice um, round yeah. up there. Does anybody else want to come in on, on that before we move on? We, we've just got a couple more questions to go. We are drawing to a close now. But does anybody else want to come in on that? 
Sure. I would like to add one point. Like uh, recently, we have seen ISSPs, FRS1 and FRS2 are here, and there is a requirement that you have to, uh, from 2024 January, and after that, all the companies reporting their financial uh, reports, they have to also report on FRS1 and FRS2. FRS1 is uh, disclosures about uh, sustainability guidelines in journal, and FRS2 is about climate-related disclosures. So all the listed companies who are going for their financial reporting, they have to also disclose on these two disclosures along with their financial uh, disclosures every year so that is something i i be aware i see tcc will be more into esg disclosures and they will be uh, adopting these esg principles into their business that's all from my side mm -hmm. i would okay, like to add uh, i would like to add one more point uh, here uh, because Please, if sir. you see the traditional financial uh, report in compliance with ifrs uh, wherever you are in the world, uh, whatever the company may be, whether it is African company, Africa-based company, or Europe-based company, their financial report will look almost the same. But it is not true in terms of uh, sustainability report. Uh, the standardization is still not there. Uh, even the company operating next to one company, uh, uh, their sustainability reports differ a lot. So that standardization is uh, very much required. And I think IFRS is uh, working very closely with the GRI and other other standard bodies uh, to to bridge particular gap and uh, sooner or later we will have more standard uh, uh, sustainability report uh, since esg is a subset of sustainability basically uh, i would uh, i would still say it's a sustainability report not esg report and yes uh, that is coming basically okay so that's interesting um, before we move on anybody else got want to add to this discussion Okay, um, Bridgesh, I know you are quite keen to talk about the regulatory perspectives within Asia. So, um, as I say, we are well over, so I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about this, but if you could just kick off a little discussion on, on this, and then I will open that to everybody else. So, regulatory perspectives within Asia. Um, what are your thoughts about that? ACI is very much quickly developing sustainable finance uh, frameworks that represent a strong commitment to ESG principles. For example, uh, the GCC in essence, we already discussed about SCA, but let's not forget Saudi Arabia's Vision 2030, which include extensive sustainability programs to diversify the economy and minimize its carbon footprint. Uh, India, we already discussed about BRSR, but the main intention or the, of BRSR is what? It, it boosts basically the openness transparency and accountability. For China, they have made tremendous progress uh, with its Green Bond Endorse Project Catalog, which establishes clear role um, uh, for Green Bond uh, while promoting openness and basically investor trust. For Singapore, Monetary Authority of Singapore released its Green Finance Action Plan that places Singapore as major hub for green finance in Asia, which is backed by initiatives like green and sustainability linked loan uh, schemes. Japan's FSL, which is Financial Services Agency, uh, it has included ESG disclosure standards to its corporate governance rule. So it improves again sustainability reporting. So this legal developments are accelerating local sustainable investments and supports uh, cross-border green finance flows within Asia and the GCC countries. So collective efforts across these areas are establishing basically a strong ecosystem for sustainable finance. Uh, that is from my side. Okay, thanks for that. And anybody else want to come in on that point? I think regulation is definitely a very important driver for sustainability, especially for the private companies because for individual private companies, they don't really have much incentive to look after the broader public goods like climate or air or water. So that's why there has to be regulatory um, pressure and it's there. Um, but what I see as a challenge that, um, that we have problem with standardizing the sustainability reporting that Bridgesh has pointed out correctly um, is that for financial reporting, we, have, we do accounting. And based on accounting, we prepare the financial report. But for sustainability reporting, we don't have a proper sustainability accounting frameworks and practices and tools. So what we are doing, we are pre preparing reports without accounting. And that's creates, so it's like a, without a proper foundation, we are actually uh, creating a report. And that's creating a lot of discrepancies as well. And it's not going to disappear anytime soon until we find more uh, acceptable and widely accepted uh, 
sustainability accounting tools and techniques for companies to use. Okay, thank yeah. you for that. And yes, Adding to God. this, right? Yeah, uh, there are also a lot of cultural differences and, uh, you know, the costs involved. So there's this, all these considerations have to be met, right? You know, there is, since there is this IFRS reporting, they're all evolving so much. So the cultural differences have to be considered, the locations, the, the, you know, the, the standardization of the data, the quality of data, those things also have to be considered while coming up with the framework. Okay, well, I thought I would do then. I got one more question to ask you. But when I've asked that question, I thought I'd, all, I'd give you each 30 seconds to give me your thoughts, um, to sort of sum up your thoughts, maybe based on what you've heard today or something else. It's sort of cut lunch, really, whatever you want to say, within reason. <laughs> so let me just ask one more question, and then, I'll, and then I will um, give you all 30 seconds each. So... Um, Challenges and opportunities for Asian organizations. Um, Brishesh, any thoughts about that? So it's like uh, even Stevens basically. So you can say Asian organizations uh, confront both considerable challenges as well as opportunity when adopting to this ESG practices. On the challenges side, basically, the, the we have to manage multiple regulatory regimes we have to assure accurate data reporting so and incorporate esg concepts across cultural uh, boundaries that we just discussed so financial restrictions as well as in uh, involving uh, it involves in a uh, very wide variety of stakeholders and uh, that actually makes things sometimes complicated but opportunities are very much considerable effective esg implementation may result into market distinctiveness basically it improves brand image and access to green uh, green funding basically and I already discussed about Singapore's green funding action and China's green bond. So regulatory alignment uh, is also very much uh, ensured, uh, while ESG measures often increase operational efficiency and profitability for any any organization or country in general. So furthermore, it actually hints us towards reducing our uh, kg of carbon dioxide per GDP. So in Asian countries, China is, I think, around 0.5 and uh, and uh, India and Japan and uh, Saudi are somewhere around 0.3 and UAE has the lowest 0.2. So in addition to what I just discussed, Asian green bond market is also expanding with China. Is, I think they are, they are issuing uh, uh, USD 57.2 billion in green bonds uh, in 2020, 2021. So it established itself as a worldwide leader. And Singapore's uh, Green Action Finance, it offers fund for sustainable finance, which promotes basically green loan and development. So again, India's uh, required ESG reporting for the top thousand listed firms, it promotes transparency. So uh, basically, uh, in a nutshell, uh, our strategies, our actions, uh, they, that all uh, promote our regional innovation and cooperation and contributes to Asia's long-term infrastructural development. So this opportunities enable Asian organizations to take the lead in global sustainability initiatives. It promotes economic resilience and prosperity. Summarizing, despite the challenges, adopting ESG has a very huge strategic advantages, establishing Asian companies as global sustainability leaders. Okay, thank you for that. And anybody want to add to the question of challenges and opportunities for Asian organizations. Sorry, like... of... Yeah, sure, sure. Go sure, ahead. Sure. Go over. <laughs> Please go ahead. Okay. Okay, okay, okay. I would like to add, as I've been part of many mid-reality assessment for different organizations, and mid-reality assessment is something where you see the impact of an organization on their environment and society, and uh, there is a uh, single mid-reality and double mid-reality. In single mid-reality, you see the impact of sustainability frameworks on the business operation and how it is going to be working in the next uh, few years. So there are these two concepts, and I have been part of multiple mid-reality assessment where we identify the risk and opportunities for different organizations, and really these are like policy and risk related market and economic repetition related technology risk and opportunity we talk about it is more about resource efficiency energy source product and services enhancement and their competitiveness so considering this i have always suggested all of my clients to do that uh, roi return on investment thing because they, they see that initial investment as something like uh, a big hard stone they won't don't want to swallow and they don't want to invest that big money 
to drive ESG cooperation, then drive technology uh, integration uh, stuff. So then we offer them ROI thing, and that is very uh, rare. All of the clients always say, "Okay, how do how do you do this?" So we plan, we see, we uh, measure everything against the existing regulation, what's coming in the uh, next two years, next three years, next five years, and then we develop that plan. And there we discuss about a lot of uh, risk and opportunities. And from that point, I can tell there are there is huge potential if we start integrating these these principles into the businesses they are able to compete with the world best organizations because if i talk about microsoft they are doing great if i talk about apple if uh, anyone anyone of you have seen their sustainability report it was it was rare it was unique it was innovative they they did that whole uh, sustainability report in one video so there are unique concept there are things there are unique ways to measure your roi your benefits from something if you are integrating so that is something instead of just Telling them there are risks and there are opportunities. ROI is the thing. If you show your clients, if you show your companies, or if you show anyone, they are more interested in knowing more. How do you do? Okay, how is this is going to benefit us in five years? Or if we are not doing it, where we are going to be standing after five years? Okay, thank you for that. And I think Bagavi, you wanted to say something as well. I just I want to add just one more point that you know the investor demands are increasing uh, rapidly and. Uh, access to more capital and uh, you know it can attract more uh, investment opportunities it's a good uh, uh, sign actually that's it okay thank you and anybody else have anything to, to say yeah sure sure michael i did want to note that uh even though my my uh, idea of esg here is i don't see it as that that big of a, of a, a factor yeah one thing that should be noted was uh, last year, for example, 85% of the investment into the Philippines came from the EU. And with the EU mindset, which is heavily ESG aimed, uh, I'm actually expecting that to see quite a bit of a change in the next year or two because of that financial yeah, that's influence. That's interesting because the EU has recently passed the here we go. The Corporate Sustainability Due Diligence Directive, CSDDD, which is about um, companies above a certain size within the EU being obliged to follow certain environmental standards and also looking very closely at the human rights in the supply chain. And the Philippines being a recipient of a lot of EU money was obviously an important part of those supply chains. And, um, and the penalties for directors for, for companies that trade in the EU that don't do this are quite severe. Uh, in, France, in France, they're even talking about potential of jail sentences. So it's going to have a big impact on the Philippines, I'm, I'm guessing. I think so. Okay. Anybody else? Uh, well, um, Singapore else? has um, FT with EU, so we have to very closely follow the rules of FTA cooperate with the EU very closely and follow their standards. And that's one of the reasons that Singapore has been very stringent on uh, all the sustainability standards. A lot is coming through the trade connectivity, not just from the um, EU, also from individual co companies from the other countries as well, from Japan, from the US, uh, of course, from EU, Australia. Um, then if you're trading with somebody and you have to follow certain rules and standards with your trading and partners or investors, um, they will definitely bring in certain um, standards that you have to follow in ASEAN countries or in other Asian countries. Even in uh, countries like in Bangladesh, for example, a lot of garments factories are now producing sustainability reports because the EU um, buyers want it. So, yep, it's getting everywhere. Okay, thank you. I think that's, that's been a very, very good discussion, actually. Um, I think we need we, we, we can't talk forever, though. We do need to draw, draw an end. So what I'm going to do is give you all an opportunity, give you all 30 seconds to, to say whatever thoughts you have, really, but maybe related to what we've been talking about today. Um, anybody want to go first? Um, can I please? Please do. So just adding to what Bhargavis was discussing about uh, 
culture. So, for example, in GCC countries, uh, we have cultural values such as Estidama, which means sustainability, and HIPS, which means preservation. So, again, it is pointing towards resource conservation and uh, and having responsible business. For India, since I'm coming from India, we have ancient philosophy of Vasudev Kutumbakam, which, which means the world is one family. So, whatever India is doing, it is it is promoting inclusive growth and sustainable development, which influences businesses um, uh, to have duty for the society and environment. Japanese, they believe on Motanai principle, which is which means respect for resources. China, again, uh, influenced by Confucian and Taoist belief uh, uh, to include or to, to, to establish harmony between human activity and environment. So in a nutshell, yes, we are culturally diverse, but the aim is more or less same to conserve resources and to contribute towards society and environment. So let's close uh, with that particular note uh, uh, to, uh, to work as a team, uh, as, a, as a cooperation uh, to build more sustainable society. Thank you. Thank you for that, Prajesh. And I love the idea of the world being one family. I think that's a great concept. And uh, yeah, uh, what I would dearly hope was true, uh, if, if nothing else. Um, anybody else? Yeah. To, 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 so to uh, I would like to add that there should be a, a you know taking care of the, all the greenwashing, false environmental claims. So there should be enough sufficient policies to ensure that whatever the claiming, the disclosures, the reporting is uh, accurate. And uh, because uh, still still this is evolving, this, these are just disclosures. But the actual practices, I I I, I just want the, the measures of you know uh, evaluating the practices are also improving so that is something because korea korea has announced the fair trade policy wherein they they ensure that the claims are accurate environmental claims so i think every asian country or across the globe must implement this okay thank you for that Bugave. now anybody else wish to come in with their 30 seconds oh okay I, I'm not really formulated this yet, but I'll give it a shot. Um, one of the biggest problems I see with the uh, with ESG is uh, and and the actual activities of reducing, on well, my case, uh, transport pollution. Uh, people are depending on something that's that's just not working, and that's uh, electric vehicles. As much as nice as they sound. They're, they're being uh, ignored in the U.S. They're being stowed away in, in land lots in China. You know, there has to be a, a bridge solution, something that will get us from the emissions rate that we're going now to the emissions rate that, will, that actually would be acceptable in, say, 15, 20 years' time. And maybe by then a real solution will, be, will come about. Is that the case that people aren't? I mean, I thought I thought the latest Tesla model was the most successful car in the world at the moment. Did I not read that somewhere recently? Or um... yeah, well, in uh, in the U.S., actually, I've seen uh, distributors reporting that uh, they there's they normally would have a one month supply of any particular vehicle, and of EVs, they have a twelve month supply which means they're sitting in their lots. Okay. All right. Well, thank you for that, Dan. Anybody else have anything to add? Yeah. Uh, I would like to add a uh, few, like, uh, if I see from when I, the SDG, Sustainable Development Goals, came into existence in 2015, and there was a thing that initially we linked all of these things with our emotions, like we need to serve the society, we need to help the unprivileged, and we need to be partner and collaborate with each other uh, to uh, lift these goals and to uh, achieve that agenda of 2030. And uh, we have seen that uh, uh, then we try to link it with the marketing tools and competitiveness and uh, for business uh, enhancement and for gaining more business. And ultimately now I am linked, we are all of us, we are linking as you know, there is FRS1 and FRS2, it is about to be implemented and all the companies are now responsible to report on that. So now 
they have to integrate it with financial disclosures they have to give the benefits they are achieving those or esg or something so we have been one by one linking it with all important things all important impacts that uh, like uh, that that are going to be very important for every human so the with time marketing has the highest impact till now and i believe now the finance is going to be yeah, give a higher impact uh, than the marketing so this is something we need to drive from different directions for some people esg drives from the emotional side for some people it is more about business and so for some people it is more about uh, finance so it is different and everyone when we are developing and we are to try uh, to how to help someone so different clients or i want to grow my company in that perspective we need to find our very right own way which work for us that how why do we want to do the esg so it's some days it's different some days it's tough. some days it's different for uh, one company in uh, maybe india and some days it's different for a company in maybe singapore so that's why that is, is important to understand the vision, the reason, and the purpose behind it, why you want to integrate it. So it's always going to be different, that's all. Okay, thank you for that, um, Hera. And um, I have, I'm going to, over to you, Asif. Have you got okay, anything? So I'm, anything I'm the last add? person to make you are. at some points. Yeah, so I actually have, for Asia being very diverse, I would suggest for Asian companies and their countries and the communities to go for nature-based solution, and which we have been doing for hundreds of years very well. And looking back to our own um, natural requirements, natural base, and how we can live in harmony with nature can bring us very low cost solutions. And one of the example I always give that Australian Aboriginals are the, I think the, like the oldest living civilization in the world today, who have been living with their community and nature-based solution for 40 plus thousands years. And living in Australia for quite some time, one thing I've learned that, that you can actually learn from communities, indigenous communities, a lot in terms of sustainability. And that's something I would like to promote all over Asia because that's what we need. We cannot have a costly high-tech environmental solutions, but we have to go for something practical and something big we can do with our resources, with our communities at a lower cost. Okay, thank you for that. And uh, Asif, I've just realized that I was showing um, the Garvey's bio when you were talking, so sorry about that. <laughs> Here is your bio. <laughs> um, look, I'm, I'm so sorry to that we do need to close now, but we have had a question which for some reason hasn't shown up on my screen, but I've seen it on um, um, on LinkedIn. And I don't want to spend much time on this question. I really think we need to close, but I think it should, we should at least um, answer it briefly. Constance Mia has said, good evening. I have uh, I don't know whereabouts in the world she is, but obviously it's evening where she is. So somewhere out your way, I would imagine, Nassif. Good evening. I have a question to the panelists. The new Unilever CEO announced that the company will water down on their sustainability strategy and focus more on the profitability, claiming that ESG will, ob will, will obsolete within the next five years. What are your thoughts on this development? Has anyone got any thoughts on that? Um, sure. Can, can I please? Of course. So, yes, from business per perspective, uh, majority of CEOs, they have to understand that uh, short term profit profitability is crucial. Yes. But the long term sustainability and resilience of a company is also equally important. So balance approach that that can integrate both financial performance and sustainability or ESG considerations is likely to be more sustainable and beneficial for Unilever in the longer run. So okay so thank is, you for that. anybody that else want to come in on the answer. okay so anybody else want to come in on the unilever point before we close okay i well thank you very much everybody um see sorry were you about to say something then or was i jumping the gun no, no that's fine. I, um okay well thank you very much everybody thank you all and thank you for watching and see you no ESG show next week and then we'll be back in in two weeks time when we'll be looking at the supply chain across three continents but thank you very much everybody 
and see you all soon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. I said this question because I want to.